this is Jill Simonello with Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk and today I am driving the 2023 Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. So that's right, this is a plug-in hybrid. And what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna walk you through some of the powertrain changes. We're gonna talk a little bit about the exterior and interior differences. And then I'm going to answer a question that somebody asked me on social media. Would you buy this over a Toyota RAV4 Prime? So you're gonna have to watch all the way to the end to see that one. So let's take a closer look right now. All right, since this model is the plug-in hybrid variant, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about the powertrain. So this is a 2.4 liter Atkinson cycle, four cylinder engine, delivers 248 horsepower. And this is not the same engine that you will see in the regular Outlander. It's mated to the hybrid powertrain system. And what's really interesting about this vehicle is it's a dual motor system and your front motor is gonna deliver 85 kilowatts while the rear motor is going to deliver over 100 kilowatts. Now, the reason for that is because your engine up here can help deliver powers to power to your wheels in the front, but there is no drive shaft drive shaft that connects these two motors, and so you use the 100 kilowatt motor in the rear, which is completely dedicated to the rear wheels. Now, the interesting thing about this vehicle, I guess I should say another interesting thing about this vehicle is the fact that this is standard all-wheel drive and it is all all the time all wheel drive so you never have like a front wheel drive option it is it is always all wheel drive and the rear motor is always going to be sending power to the rear wheels now walking back over onto the rear passenger side we also have to talk a little bit about the fact that you have two like charging options here so this right here is gonna be your regular, I'm gonna plug this into a level two charger or a 110 volt uh, plug at home. Um, but this right here is going to be a DC fast charge. This is one of the only plug-in, actually I think it's the only plug-in hybrid that has fast charge capability, but this does not look like a fast charger that we have seen Recently, this is actually Chatamo, and the reason for that is because Chatamo is the standard charging for fast charge in Japan, and this is a really big vehicle in Japan, and even though this is not the standard in the United States, you can still find Chatamo. I've even seen them at Electrify America stations recently. So if you are going to just use your regular and plug it into the wall kind of thing, this will charge in about six hours. If for whatever reason you decided to go to a fast charge and you wanted to spend some money there, this Chatamo would allow you to get up to 80% of the charge. So you're looking at about 30 miles of range um, in about 30 minutes. So uh, yeah, I find that interesting. You have both the ability to do the regular charge as well as the uh, DC fast charge. Now, the other thing that I'm just going to mention really quick is we talked about range. This has um, overall EPA estimated 38 miles of all electric range, but we are seeing about 41 or 42. And again, if you were gonna charge up to 80% using the DC fast charge, you'd probably get to about 30 miles of all electric range. Now that we've got the powertrain out of the way, I just wanna do a quick walk around here because one of the big things you're gonna notice is this doesn't really look any different than the regular gasoline ICE model, internal combustion engine model. Uh, you've got the same styling on the nose. The big difference is going to be the badging that you will see right here. You've got the EV um, plug-in electric hybrid badging there. and um, while these are not standard, you have available 20 inch wheels. And um, I think only the base comes with the lower wheels and then pretty much everything else comes with 20 inch wheels. Um, you also have this two tone paint option, which is new for the 2023 model year. And then again, over on this side, you have PHEV badging and you have your charge ports right here and your PHEV badging on the side. But other than that, this looks remarkably like the gasoline model. 
on the exterior. And frankly, on the inside, it doesn't look that much different either. On the interior, the biggest difference you are going to notice is going to be these two buttons right here. Uh, so first off, let's start with this, this EV button. And yes, it will put your vehicle into EV mode. So you start out in normal, you hit the button, you go into EV mode, that's just going to push you into using all of the electric motor battery power, no gasoline engine kicks in. If you hit it again, this will be the save button. So you can see right here, I have 29 miles of all electric range. I hop on the highway and say I just want to save that battery power. Power, I hit that button and then when I get off the highway I'm still gonna have 29 miles of all electric range now you hit that button again and I find this button really interesting this allows you to use your engine to charge your battery now it will only charge your battery up to 80% and because I'm at 29 miles of range I can't actually hit this button and have it work uh, but if I were down a little bit lower and I hit that button the engine would pop on and it would start charging that battery if I'm at a standstill that battery will charge in about a half an hour so just idling charging my battery if I hopped on the highway and was driving you know 70 miles an hour it would probably take about an hour to get up to 80% of a charge so I find this button really interesting and you know you hit it again you're back in normal mode and that's just gonna let the vehicle decide what is the most efficient way to drive at any moment and time so you're letting the vehicle make the decisions so the other button that is going to be different is this right here which that's an interesting little symbol this is going to be your innovative pedal button and so basically you hit this button and you have a little green thing that pops up behind a little green icon that pops up behind the wheel and what that will do is it will allow for one pedal driving. So if you're familiar with an EV, the essential um, gist of that is as soon as like you put your foot on the accelerator, the vehicle goes forward, you take your foot off the accelerator without pushing your foot on the brake and the vehicle will automatically slow down. So you basically modulate your speed just with your accelerator pedal, or I guess I could still call it a gas pedal because this isn't pure EV. But um, you're just modulating your speed there. But here's the thing with this innovative uh, pedal button, this is not completely one pedal driving. They call it near one pedal driving because it'll get you almost to a stop and then you start coasting. So um, you do have to use your brake pedal to come to a complete stop, but you can, you know, when you're driving on windy roads or something, it's actually kind of fun to just use your gas pedal instead of, you know, going from brake to grass, brake to gas, brake to gas. So um, nice little option. The other thing that you can do is if you turn this off, so you see the little icon is gone, you can use your... Um, pedals, these are not actually shifters. This is um, going to give you more regeneration or less regeneration depending on whether or not you're going up or down. And so when you get to the most regenerative state, that is not as regenerative as it's going to be if you hit this button here. So if you're always looking for the optimal braking regeneration, you're going to want to hit that I pedal button. But if you just want to play around with it, if you like more of the ice coasting feel you can you know use your paddles and find what is great for you now the one thing that I will point out is if you want to use the one pedal driving or if you are going to use your paddles the default is normal the default is going to be like normal coasting normal drive style so you're going to have to adjust this every time you get into the vehicle and for my preferences okay I'm just going to hit one button and I'm just going to hit this button because it works really well but yeah it doesn't default to one pedal driving, you're going to have to change it every time. Obviously, because this is a PHEV, another thing that you will notice is in your behind the wheel gauges, they are a little bit different um, and you will see your state of charge. You're going to see um, how high your battery is and you're going to be able to check out your energy flow. So that as well is going to be different from the regular gasoline version. But then, you know, you're going to have some fun things like your super all wheel control um, gauge that's going to show you which wheels are getting power and which wheels are stuck. So um, I don't know. Pretty cool there. And there is one more thing that is different on this vehicle than you will see on the regular gasoline model. And for that, we have to open up the trunk. 
And that is going to be this right here. You have an actual 1500 watt plug. That is going to be enough to power a coffee maker, a hair dryer, um, and it's going to be great for tailgating. So uh, you may have also noticed that, yep, this actually has the third row seat. I did get a lot of questions on social media when I posted a picture. Does the PHEV have the third row seat? And yes, it does. Does it take up any more cargo space? Not really. I think there is a small difference, but it's nominal. So you're still going to get some really good cargo volume. As you can see with your third row seats up, you can actually stack some good stuff back here. But if you want to talk about legroom, well, yeah, let's check that out a little bit closer. Now, because this has a third row, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about it just a little bit. So first off, access is fairly easy with just a lever and then the slide, the seat slide forward. And you're going to have a little bit of a tight squeeze. But keep in mind, this back seat is totally going to be designed for somebody who is about my size. So you have a little bit of a tight squeeze and you can just alley-oop your way in. Because these seats do slide a little bit, you do have the opportunity to have, I'll say decent legroom not back here. Not generous legroom, but decent legroom. However, the compromise is going to be then in the second row. So with these seats slid all the way forward, I probably have about three or four inches between my knee and the back of the seat. But if you slide these seats all the way back, I literally have to slide my feet sideways and um, sit maybe Indian style. I can't fit my legs down. So I'm going to say that you're really not going to fit anybody more than um, like about five feet tall in this back seat moderately comfortably. And this is really going to be only in emergencies only because Again, we'll show you, but you very much compromise the leg room in the second row to accommodate the third row. So that's going to be a tight squeeze. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not for a road trip. All right. So as you can see, this seat over here is slid in the far forward position and I don't have a lot of room between my knees and this person right here. So if I'm going to make this work, this person is also going to have to slide forward a little bit so that I have more than maybe an inch of leg room between my knee and this seat right here. Again, I'm about five feet tall, so it's doable. It's totally doable. But anybody taller than me sitting behind anybody taller than me behind sitting, sitting behind anybody taller than me, it's probably going to be a tad tight and I'm going back to the in case of emergency only. Before we get into whether I would buy a Toyota RAV4 Prime over this vehicle, I'm going to give you some general driving impressions. So the first thing I'm going to point out is I like the fact that there are seven drive modes. So you're going to accommodate everything from snow to mud to driving on pavement to um, getting a little bit sporty and I appreciate that. I kept it in eco mode most of the time because I was trying to get the best bang for my fuel efficiency buck, uh, but when you switch it over to either tarmac or power, so power is going to give you both the benefits of the engine and the electric motors, when you switch it over there, you do get some decent acceleration. It's not going to be 5.7 seconds fast, but that was in power mode right there and did pretty well. So um, not hurt flipping fast, but definitely fast enough. I like the handling of this vehicle. We took it to a road um, course uh, racetrack and we took it off road. So we, we went mudding, um, got a little bit dirty and this handled really well in all of those situations. Now, granted on the racetrack, I wasn't trying to drift into the corners or go a hundred miles per hour, but the handling is really good. The super all wheel control is tuned so that it kind of mitigates a lot of the body roll. So that's going to prevent your passengers from getting uh, car sick and it just makes everything run a little bit smoother. So in general, this is a very comfortable vehicle. As a petite driver, I will say don't quite have exactly the right driving position. The seat feels a little bit big to me. The seat bottom is a little bit long and I, I just wish I could sit maybe a little bit higher, but this isn't bad. This is generally a very decent 
position for a petite driver. And again, the ride and handling is really nice. Now we're gonna get to that thing that I know you wanna know about, and that is RAV4 Prime versus the Outlander PHEV. Now when I mentioned that I would be driving the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV this week, I actually got some questions on social media about how this compares to other plug-in hybrids on the market and would you buy this over, say, the Toyota RAV4 Prime? And what I want to say is that's a really tough question because the Toyota RAV4 Prime is literally one of my favorite vehicles out there on the market right now. It's fast, it's peppy, it's maneuverable, it's just the right size, but you know, it, there are some compromises. It doesn't have a third row, even though it is slightly ridiculous in this vehicle. It um, also really, frankly, isn't available. And because this vehicle is new, you'll probably have a better chance of getting your hands on it than you would a Toyota RAV4 Prime. So I wanna say this vehicle is definitely a little bit more solid, a little bit more planted than the Toyota RAV4 Prime. The handling is really good. The all wheel drive is phenomenal. I had a lot of fun playing in the mud earlier. And you know, I, I don't know, it's tough. The RAV4 definitely is faster off the line and a little bit more aggressive in terms of passing maneuvers, but this vehicle does just fine. So what I did is I took some notes and I just wanted to do a quick verbal spec comparison so that you can see like head to head what you're looking at. So the Prime has 302 horsepower. This has 248 horsepower. Can I feel the difference? I can feel the difference. Is it horrible? It's not horrible. This is, this is good. This is a good vehicle. Um, the RAV4 Prime is going to seat five. This can seat up to seven. Uh, the RAV4 Prime gets 42 miles of range, EPA estimated. This gets 38 EPA estimated miles of range. Four miles, is that a big deal? No, I don't, I don't think it is. I think that's pretty comparable. Um, both have standard all-wheel drive. Uh, the Toyota Prius Prime does get 94 miles per gallon equivalent, whereas this only gets 64 miles per gallon equivalent. And I find that slightly ironic because the Prime has more horsepower. So it could have a little bit to do with the inefficiencies of the engine, and it could also have to do with the fact that this has less all-electric range. Then you're looking at the base price, and again, it's all pretty comparable. So you've got the base price of the Toyota Prius Prime. It's going to be $41,635, and the base price of this vehicle is $41,190. Both of those include destination fees. So this is a little less expensive, but, um, you know, it has also a little less oomph. Um, so would I buy this over the Toyota Prius Prime? That is a tough question because as I said, when I first started, the Toyota Prius Prime is my favorite SUV right now. This is a solid vehicle. If you want to plug in hybrid right now and you don't want a toy for a Toyota Prius Prime or something else, I don't think you can go wrong with buying the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. I like this vehicle. They've done a great job with it. All right, that's it. That is what I have for you on the 2023 Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. I really like this vehicle. I think Mitsubishi has done a great job with it. It's got good ride and handling and the interior appointments, especially on this SEL premium trim, are top notch. So thanks for watching. I want you to comment below and tell me whether you would get this over a RAV4 Prime. Go ahead, take the time, comment below. But after you comment, be sure to check us out on the web at pickuptrucktalk.com. There will be more information and a written review of this vehicle there. And then I will see you down the road.